All right, welcome. So uh, I am not Victoria Seek. Um, Major Victoria Seek had to go home early, so I am not the Beijing guru standing in the front, unfortunately. Uh, my name is Gina Sigler, and I work with her at the STAT CUE, and I will be chairing this session. So hopefully you want to learn a lot about Beijing. Otherwise, this is the wrong room. <laughs> um, but we're going to start with Dr. James Ferry. Uh, Dr. Ferry has been developing Bayesian analytics at Metron for 18 years. He has been the principal investigator for a variety of R&D projects that apply Bayesian methods to data fusion, network science, and machine learning. The projects range from associating disparate data types from multiple sensors, from missile defense, developing methods to track hidden structures on dynamically changing networks, Computing incisive analytics efficiently for information in large data beta, bleh, databases and countering adversarial attacks on neural network-based image classifiers. Dr. Ferry was active in the network science community in the 1910s. He has organized many different conferences. Read the bio if you want more information. Um, but his focus has been on Bayesian analysis and network science algorithms in uh, the near future here. Prior to Matron, he worked as a computational fluid dynamicist, and he developed models in supercomputer simulations for the multi-phase fluid dynamics of rocket engines at the Center for Simulation of Advanced Rockets at UIUC. He has 30 plus technical publications in fluid dynamics, network science, and Bayesian analytics, and has a bachelor's in mathematics from MIT and a PhD in applied math from Brown. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Ferry. Thank you. So the, the one thing you'll notice in that bio, there's no mention of T&E. So <laughs> coming to this, uh, oh, OK. So I can't see my own slides on here, just my own. Oh, here, here it goes. OK, great. Um, right. So so we, we started this project in September to it, it, I view it as kind of an outsider's look on um, the t and &E process. So we're kind of thinking through from first principles, you know, like you know, we, we do a lot of Bayesian methodologies. What would we do um, for T&E? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the, the, what I'm going to present to you is, um, you know, an overview of classical statistics versus Bayesian reasoning. You got a lot of a tutorial if you went to that on Tuesday. Um, and then the thing we're adding here, I guess, is a Bayesian decision theory. It's, um, and then I'm going to show you what this Bayesian decision theory paradigm looks like for T&E. I have some plots called decision charts, which are sort of a nice output of this method. Uh, and then at the end, I tacked on a little um, something that has nothing to do with any of the rest of this, but it was cool. So I put it in. So, OK. OK, so classical stats. Um, so yeah, what's, what's the difference? Um, well, if you have an infinite amount of data, there's really no difference because, you know, if you have an infinite sequence of heads and tails, both the, uh, the, the frequentist and the Bayesian will agree that the probability is just, you know, the proportion of heads to tails in there. Um, so I, I like thinking about this infinite data limit. I th think it helps clarify some things. Um, so it, it's only when you have finite data that there's a distinction. Yes? Oh, am I not? Oh, right. It's right up here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> the online viewers may thank you too. Um, okay, so we can look at this example of heads and coins with um, you know, only a finite amount of data. Okay. okay, so so in, in this slide, there's, it shows you sort of there's a very different mindset in terms of what a classical statistician and a Bayesian would do with this problem. Uh, the classical stats, the first thing you might do is like, well, let's compute an, an estimator for this parameter p, which is the probability of the coin coming up heads. And then you say, well, OK, that's just a point estimate. We can put a range on that. So that's, that's your confidence interval. And then you can compute it for these different cases. In Bayesian reasoning, you're not, you know, there, there is this notion of a, um, I call it containment interval, but uh, it's a credible interval is, I think, the proper term. Um, but that's kind of this thing that you just add on if you want to talk to to classical statisticians. Really, you just say, well, mm -hmm. I had a prior distribution on the probability of uh, uh, on this parameter p, and I'm updating it to a posterior, and then I'm, I'm done. So um, I have to put on my glasses, but I can't see my own slides. <laughs> Sorry. 
Okay. So the big distinction between classical statistics and Bayesian reasoning is that in classical statistics, there's this parameter P, but it's, it's not considered random. It's just unknown. There's no model for it. Um, whereas in Bayesian reasoning, you put a prior on it. And once you put a prior on a parameter, ever after that, you are updating that with data. And so you always have a probability distribution around to use. That's going to be very important. It's, uh, it's a great thing to have. Um, another thing I'd point out here is when you're computing a confidence interval, I, I think the way I look at it, that there's a definition of a confidence interval that says it's the mid-95 percentile of the data, the outcomes. That's the thing you have a probability distribution on. So the confidence interval is just the set of values of P uh, that are consistent, that 95% um, mid 95% of the outcomes is consistent with the observed data. So in this example here, if we have 60 coin flips and we have observed that 33 of them are heads, well, you can just compute, you have a model for the probability of the number of heads given your P, so you can just find all the P that are consistent with that 33. So here, um, you know, we, uh, if P were 0.65, well, the mid 95 percentile of outcomes H for that value of P would be 32 to 46 heads. We see oh, our data 33, it lies within that range. So that P is in our confidence interval. On the other hand, Bayesian reasoning, like the Bayesian reasoning, the, the containment interval is the thing that you actually want the confidence interval to be. You just say, well, you want the mid 95 percentile of P, you compute that and then you're done. So it's, it's much less convoluted it's much more straightforward. Um, I think I'll move to the next slide to say these things. Um, so Bayesian reasoning, it's really a scientific mindset. You know, the focus is on the things that cause things. You're reasoning about how outcomes are the results of how, how causes cause results. And the, um, in Classical statistics, you, you, you reason the other way around. You say, well, I have all these, these data, and therefore the thing I want to infer is the cause, and so I just kind of try to just directly reason in that direction. That's okay. It, it's fast. It's, it's simple. There are a number of tools where you can do that. But once you start getting complicated scenarios, then these things start to break down. Things become hard to interpret. Um, and then the final thing about Bayesian reasoning, the thing that really clinched it for me, that kind of converted me, is that um, it is the unique extension of classical logic to handle uncertainty. This is something that was really only articulated very forcefully um, in James's book in 2003, uh, The Probability Theory, The Logic of Science. So, I mean, I find that very compelling. Like, logic is, like, true and false. You have these two discrete options, and then you can... You can um, uh, do all this inference to figure out what other things are true and false. And Bayesian reasoning is really just the extension of that in, in two situations where things can lie between true and false. Okay, but you can say, well, okay, I said it was hard, so why put in the effort? Um, the, the reason to put in the effort, I think, is there is a killer application of uh, the ability to always have a probability distribution around, and that's Bayesian decision theory. So Bayesian decision theory, it distills your stakeholder priorities into a utility function that defines how good a system is. Um, so once you're able to do that, once you're able to define like what makes a good system, then I think this is on the next slide. No, it's not. Um, once you define how good a system is, and you have the ability to calculate all the probabilities you need, then Bayesian decision theory allows you to make optimal decisions with those probabilities and that utility function. So, okay. <clears throat> so then, with that background, here's the framework that we that we're working under for this project. Um, in this framework, we're really only able to handle systems where you know you use the system and you produce an outcome. Uh, this is, uh, is it's not going to handle these full, um, you know, very complex systems at, at this point. Um, so, so the first step of the framework then is you actually have to map the raw uh, 
outputs of a testing event into you know some kind of structured form that you can use and and so you could have very simple things like all, all the outcome of the system could be simple as a hit or a miss it could be um, like if it failed at some stage like it needs to go all the way to stage five to be a hit then you and you, you could just have that stage that it reached uh, it could be an error in meters it could be you know, it could be these kind of hybrid things that either you detect or not and if you detect it you get a, a, a range in meters so these kind of simple things, but they're not necessarily like real numbers or integers. They can be these mixed types. All right, the, the next step, um, outcomes are influenced by a context. Context is something you know when you're testing. And so these are things like you know, the, the type of round you're using, the type of target, uh, the, the range at which you're firing a weapon, you know, various angles you can compute. There can be um, unintentional things that you're not setting up as part of your test design, but you can measure, like wind speed or temperature. Those aren't as useful because you can't use them in planning your test design, but they're part of this. Um, the, even the timestamp of a test, like, well, what does that tell you? It doesn't tell you anything on its own, but if you have, uh, when you're um, kind of modeling the correlation structure, tests that are nearby in time uh, can be correlated in ways that tests far apart in time are not. So. Anyway, all those things, context. And then, um, and then the system itself is represented by some unknown parameter vector P. And at this, on this slide, I don't even wanna say like P is a, a, really a vector or anything in particular. Um, I just wanna think about, uh, imagine you could do an infinite amount of experimentation with your, your system. You're able to test in all the contexts you care about. You're able to test as many times as you want so that you get a histogram of the outcomes. Well, in that case, you know, the, again, in that case, the uh, frequentist and the Bayesian agree, like, oh, great, I have a perfect characterization of my system. I don't need anything more. Um, so, uh, and in that case, you don't even really need to say what the parameter is. It's like, well, I have a system. It's kind of like a card you plug into a simulator, right? You just like test this system and it'll produce these outcomes, any context you feed, it'll give you a histogram on the possible outcomes. Okay. Um, and so now you say, well, okay, now I have finite data. So what do I want to do? Well, I have this parameter. Presumably I want to estimate that parameter. Well, no, I mean, this is a Bayesian approach. We don't want to <laughs> estimate the parameter P. We want to take a prior distribution on this parameter and update it to a posterior distribution. So in the next step, then, you have a some kind of family of probability distributions over the parameter that characterizes the system. This is getting a little abstract, but I'm going to show you a concrete example in a minute. Um, so, okay. So then what you do, when, once you have a prior distribution, any kind of probability distribution over the parameter that characterizes your system, you can define a utility function. The utility of to the utility like to the US government of accepting that system as it is, given that you have some uncertainty about what it actually is like. Right? Uh, a very simple utility you can use is what we, we're calling a compliance utility. Like, well, there's a certain, you know, someone has specified that the probability that the system perform, you know, that the parameter of the hit rate of the system, say, is at least 0.8, it has to be at least 95%. You know, that could be a compliance criterion. So whatever the compliance criteria are, you can just distill those and say, well, our utility will be some value, positive value, if it meets the criteria, and some negative value if it doesn't. Because if you actually accept a bad system, that's worse than not actually accepting it at all. Okay, and so then, uh, so when you actually are formulating this utility function, you can imagine um, you know, all sorts of different contexts. You, you can kind of define everything you want your system, all the properties that you want it to have, um, the range of conditions you want it to operate over, and those can depend on, you know, on lots of variables. But at the end, the last line here, you have to kind of roll it all up so it only depends on the probability distribution over the parameter that describes your system. Okay, and then finally, and this is where all the kind of stuff comes together. Um, so, so imagine like you have a test event and you have a maximum of n tests that you can do. Then at the decision points, you can pick the, uh, the actions that lead, uh, lead to optimal results. 
So the, the examples of ac actions of a simple system is, you know, you're imagining a system where you can, like, you have a decision point after every single test that you do. So you do a single test, and you say, should I accept the system now? Should I reject the system now, or should I continue to test? Um, you might want to, if the tests are very ex expensive, you might want to accept or reject very soon. Okay. And so, given all this setup, now we have a, a sort of a backward recursion that can generate the optimal decisions. So what we say is, um, and this is probably the most complicated equation in here, it just says the utility of being in a state where I have testing outcomes up through step k, and that's the vector x1 through k, the utility of being in that state is the maximum of the utilities of what would happen if I do one more under each of the actions I could take. So um, one action I could take is accept right now. And then the utility of the system would just be the utility for the given probability distribution pi over my parameters p. I can reject right now, and then there'd be zero utility given the way we set things up. And then the complicated part is well, what would be the utility of doing another test? Well, it depends on what the outcome of the test would be. So you have to take the expected value over the range of outcomes of that next test. And then the, the thing is, you, you know what the probability, the predictive posterior on those outcomes. And so you can compute the utility after that next test. And then you can subtract off the cost of doing the test. And if that's better than accepting right now, then you continue to test. Okay, and now here's where this will get concrete. So let's suppose we're going to do a simple test where we have um, 100 coin flips that we're allowed to do. Uh, and suppose we have some prior distribution on the probability P of that coin coming up heads. Now over here in this figure, I'm imagining there was some like uh, developmental testing on this coin flipping problem. And then when we transferred it to the operational testing of this very dangerous coin, um, we... Uh, we, we converted that DT posterior to an OT prior. So, but anyway, in this case, it's the beta distribution on P with parameters uh, 10 and 2.5. All right, so I'm gonna show you some plots. So, so I, I described how we can compute the utility of being at different states during test. Uh, and these are pictures here for different utility functions. Um, so we see uh, it, it's, well, I can't, can I point with this? I can use my finger. I can't really point. No laser. Um, so, um, but in the bottom right corner, that's for this compliance utility, you see that these high utilities occur for number of misses less than 15 or so out on the diagonal border. And then once you move up to uh, above a certain point, it turns blue. That's zero utility because you reject those systems because they're they're not very good. Uh, but depending on the utility function, so so any, so the way this works then, you just, you can compute that utility on the diagonal. It's an end state where you can't test anymore, so it's simple to compute it there. And then you just back propagate it inward to all previous states. Okay, so this gives you the utility of uh, a system at any point. But the thing you really care about is like, well, all right, well, what do I do? Uh, and that's not evident from here, like what you would actually do. And so what you do is you choose the action with maximal utility, and that gives you a decision chart. So here we're plotting in green, red, and gray, whether you accept the system now, reject the system now, or continue to test. So in this case, um, there is zero cost to testing. It's sort of a degenerate case. Um, it becomes more clear once we start to impose a test, a cost to testing. And what I'm gonna do is I just kind of flip through these to make my main point. As we kind of go through this, we're increasing the cost of a single test. We see this very um, unsurprising thing happens where that gray region where it says continue to test, it goes away. Uh, it doesn't make sense to test a lot when tests are very expensive. So, so this is kind of a great feature of this, you know, that this whole um, idea of uh, in the traditional paradigm of T&E, um, the idea of like trying to gain information and how much test costs are often handled and kind of like, well, they're kind of expensive. Maybe we shouldn't do so many. Uh, we're getting good information, but that they, they're really in different currencies. So they can't talk to each other. This puts it all in the same currency. And how much time do I have?
10 minutes. Oh, I lost it. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so I will then go back here. So another feature in here, what we're trying to do as we're doing this is on the one hand, we're trying to like just nail this all down and do it exactly on very simple cases like coin flips. And then we're trying to do it on harder cases on real data that I can't show you, um, but it, we can't do it everything so exactly and purely. So we're working on that as well. But one thing that we're gaining from doing it in these very simple stylized situations is we get to observe phenomena that surprise us and then try to explain them. And so when I was developing these plots, you see in the bottom right, um, we have these sort of two lobes. Like I, I looked at that, I was like, do I have an error in my code? Like what's going wrong Why, or what's going on? Why is this this weird kind of curvy front? Um, well, turns out, I, I didn't really tell you what these other utility functions are. So I'll describe this long-term utility function that I'm using for the top left plot that's that's just a single kind of uh, gray region. Uh, that plot says, the utility function says, the utility of the system really only depends on this probability p of the coin being heads. I just, I just care about how good the system actually is. I don't really care about how much knowledge I have about it. It's a long-term decision because it figures that, you know, once we deploy this thing, this coin, um, we will, the, over time, we'll come to know exactly how it performs. And so we don't really care about our knowledge right after testing. So that that's the uh, utility function that doesn't give us any strange behavior. This, the short in the midterm, the, the short-term decision says, no, I, uh, the commander actually has to use the thing after it comes out of tests as a probability distribution over um, you know, this parameter vector. And so since you're not sure, the short-term utility is always less than the long-term utility of B. Um, so what happens here, and then the midterm is kind of a, just a average between the two. But you can see the phenomenon clear in the midterm. Uh, so what happens there, you can think about like the, the gray region has two lobes. The top load lobe, you're continuing to test because you really need to know whether you should accept or reject the system. But in that bottom load lobe, you're already pretty sure you should accept the system, but you're continuing to refine the probability distribution on P because the better that estimate is, that will be more useful to the commander to have a system that's well characterized. So, you know, and then, so it's pretty cool that these things come out. It's like, okay, it makes sense in retrospect. So we're, you know, we're learning stuff from this. Uh, in the setup. Okay, and now I'm just gonna <laughs> talk about something I thought was neat. So as we, um, the, the next thing we were looking at was like, all right, suppose, you know, it's not just a coin flip, suppose it's actually like an error measurement, a continuum measurement, and there's some threshold on it that says, well, if it's closer than, I don't know, like 100 meters, then we call that a hit, and if it's farther, then we call it a miss. Um, surely it's better to actually use those continuum measurements than just to use the hits and misses. We're going to get more information out of them. And so we asked ourselves, well, well, how much more? Can we calculate how much more? Um, so I, I don't know if this is known or not, but it's, it was a really neat result. So, you know, here it is. Someone can tell me. It's like, oh, yeah, that's such and so theorem. Um, so, okay, so now here we have an idealized model. We're going to generate a bunch of points from a Gaussian, a 2D Gaussian distribution. And we're going to set a, a hit threshold of at 1.3. Um, and then the, uh, I guess I'm telling you that the true sigma of the Gaussian distribution here was 1. And so at that threshold, uh, you know, I don't know if anyone can do that in their head. I can't. <laughs> they had 1.3 and a 2D Gaussian. The, the threshold, 57.04% of these um, will be hits in green. Okay. So now what I can do is I can uh, I can have a prior distribution on sigma, and I think I had said it's something like uh, you know flat here. Uh, um, so I have a prior distribution on sigma, and I can compute a posterior distribution on sigma using all the data that I've observed, and then I want to convert that to p. I can say well at this sigma here's um, there's a certain corresponding uh, P that goes probability that goes along with that. So you can convert it into P space that's shown at the bottom. 
and then I can compare it to the posterior distribution uh, that I would get on P just from using the hit-miss data. And not surprisingly, you get a narrower distribution using all the data than just using the, the hit-miss data. And now we can ask ourselves, well, like, oh, how do we compare these things? Well, uh, you can compute their variances, and then it's, it's stochastic, right? It's not going to be the same during every experiment, so you can just take an expected value of the variance in each case. And find this, okay. And then you can ask yourself, uh, well, how many more of the hit-miss experiments would I need to do to get the variance as tight as I see with the uh, continuum measurements? So that's what we compute, that sort of ratio. Uh, it gives you a conversion factor from a continuum measurement to a hit-miss measurement. Okay, and in this case, in 2D, you get a nice exact formula. In other dimensions, it's some like messy thing with implicit functions. Uh, but the 2D case is kind of the one we're interested in here anyway. So you get this nice formula for this conversion factor. So um, I, I don't have a good intuition behind this, but at uh, probability of like 0.8, that's your true hit probability, you find that each distance observation is worth 1.544 hit-miss observations. So that's really cool. We, I, I plotted this uh, yeah, after I had to turn to the slide, I plotted it in like all the other numbers of dimensions. And you, you see the kind of the curve kind of shift over, but it always stays above this threshold of 1.5. So, so that's pretty neat. You can make the general statement here that it's always worth at least, you know, that, that this conversion to hit-miss is, is it's throwing away information. Uh, but, uh, and you can compute how much. Okay, so that, that's it. This is the summary. Um, so Bayesian techniques are important for TNE because as situations get more complex, the classical statistical tools get more and more challenging to apply. Um, so in Bayesian reasoning here, I, I haven't given you a great number of examples of what this kind of parameter vector P is that characterizes the system. I showed you a very simple case where it's uh, probability of a coin being heads, right? But in general, you know, this can be very complicated. I don't know how far we can push this method uh, and, and get, you know, good results with it. Uh, that's what we're working on. Um, so, uh, so then the, the utility of a system, it's a function of the, uh, the, the range. It's a function of how precisely you know this P. So if you have a certain probability distribution with this parameter P that characterizes the system, your utility of the system is a function of that, and it's a function of the probability distribution over the contexts that you intend to use the system in. So you can kind of roll all that together and uh, get a overall utility that you uh, for the system that you can then try to optimize, make optimal decisions during testing to try to produce a system, to, well, to try to make the best decisions about when to accept or reject the system. Okay, well, that's it. All right, thank you. Do we have any audience questions? If you do, I will bring you a microphone. Anybody? Okay, I've got a question then. Um, so, no Zoom questions either, I guess I should check. Um, so what do you see as some of the challenges to using this framework in uh, the RT and E world? Um, yeah, a number of things come up. I mean, it's complicated to, to even formulate what these, um, you know, these parameters. The central thing here is this, this L of X, the, the measurement likelihood function L of the outcome X given P and C. Well, that's, that's the model that you're trying to come up with for your system. If you come up with a good model, I mean, that is a great output for all of this, like the commander can say, you know, oh, okay, I can predict how my this system will behave in different scenarios. Um, of course, you never actually get that in the end because you never know what P is. So the model you actually deliver is that probability distribution over that L of X uh, given, you know, the distribution over the P. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it, it doesn't like fix, e so, you know, Bayesian methods all have these models, and so this is not a magic wand to make them easier to find or anything. It's just that you can do more with it once you have it, I think, with this Bayesian utility approach. 
Okay, we also have, I'll, I'll take one of the online questions and then uh, you've got a couple more on here just in case you're interested in looking later. But uh, the first was, do you have any guideline on the choice of utility function? Guidelines. Um, this is a place where you get to talk to um, all the stakeholders and incorporate their inputs. Um, I guess one guideline would be to start out with don't rock the boat too much. That's why we're using the, the compliance utility that kind of looks like the way um, requirements are specified anyway. So we can start with that. My, my thinking was, um, you know, when you have a compliance utility, and someone says, really, if I change this parameter a little bit, I go from having the greatest system in the world to absolute garbage and say, hey, that's what you get when you specify a threshold, right? Like, you tell me, do you want to soften that up a little bit? So I, yeah, that's what I do. Give our speaker one more round of applause. All right. Thank you.